harshly. Say it in Espanol, pero gracias. Something like that. Uh, Portuguese. Y español, los juntos. All right. Y inglés, y uh, un, un poquito. <laughs> that was beautiful, no matter what. It was beautiful. You know what? Just singing Alleluia and Glory to God, the part that I understood. <laughs> I just imagine worshiping God and how worthy He is. How worthy He is. You brought me into worship of Him. Thank you. Thank you for that. So sweet. And uh, you know what? I don't know how to handle affirmation and kind. You know, when you guys do stuff like that for us, I, I, I get embarrassed, uh, feel like a little kid, but thank you. Don't feel worthy of it, but thank you. Uh, you've been so good. Ministry is a privilege. It's a privilege. It's such an honor, and you, you folks make, it, make us so blessed. So thank you. My wife, like she says, you can never outgive God uh, or his people in ministry. So thank you. Please turn to Romans, capítulo 3, chapter 3. We'll get there in a while, but we pause our series on issues related to Sabbath in order to join a celebration. Those are always good, right? But in order to do that, we don't have a sermon today. That's another hallelujah. <laughs> no sermon today. Instead, we pay tribute to the greatest turning point in Christianity since the book of Acts. On October 31, 1517, with mallet in hand, or some believe, actually, a bottle of glue, a monk named Martin Luther posted a document to the church door in Wittenberg in what is today Germany. It contained a list of 95 theses that he hoped to publicly debate, which was the custom of the time. Does anyone know the significance of this year's October 31 date? It kind of came up, but does anyone know? You got it, half my, half my age, that's right. The 500th anniversary of the posting of the document that ignited the Protestant Reformation and in all kinds of venues and formats, Christian institutions have been celebrating this occasion. Go online, you will see the Christian world is absolutely covered in 2017 and 2018 with celebrations. But the question I'd like us to begin asking today is, what exactly are we celebrating? Is that fair? What exactly are we celebrating? Is it the great news that the reformers recovered the truth about justification by faith? That is good news. Are we celebrating how for the first time the Bible was made available in the language of the common person so that all could read. Is that great news? Yes, of course. Are we rejoicing in the priesthood of all believers? I, for one, want to go on record today because, uh, as jumping for joy because the Reformation opened the door, among other things, for clergy to marry. Hallelujah. <laughs> in fact, when asked why he got married, Luther said, quote, it's because his marriage would please his father, rile the Pope, cause the angels to laugh and the devils to weep. Well, my reasons aren't so complex, but I'm really happy anyway. Well, we can better appreciate what we're celebrating by learning what caused the Reformation to begin with. So, that's why I say it's not a sermon today, perhaps a little history lesson, but folks, if we don't understand the roots of things in Christianity, sometimes, you know, you can preach all the sermons in the world, world, but you lose the context. You lose the context for those sermons. So, let's do a little history today. Does anyone know, for five Sabbath shekels, does anyone know the main question 
that ignited the Reformation. The main question, or you get to go first in line for potluck. That'll get you. Main question. Uh, in general terms, Robert, uh, Bob has got that right, but in more specifically, it all exploded with the question, how does a person get in line first at potluck? How does a person get saved? All right, that's basically it. How does a person get right with God? How do you get right with God? Now, that doesn't sound too offensive, does it? Doesn't sound too offensive, but it was to the established church. Why? Because it questioned their authority and threatened to expose its vast corruption as well as the falsehoods they used to support that corruption. So Luther dared to question the church he seriously disputed the church's claim that indulgences could lessen time, what? Lessen time served in purgatory as punishment for our sins. What's purgatory? Besides a really beautiful place in Colorado, by the way. What is purgatory? Oh, wait, one person raised their hand because so many are giving it. Somebody. Go ahead, Bob. It's where you burn forever? Ah, well, there is, it is a hot time and a hot place. Anything else you want to add to purgatory? Well, not add, like we want more, but I mean, you know. Oh, okay, all right. The concept of purgatory is a place where people, uh, the, 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 the sinful parts of their character are punished. And so they get a certain amount of time in purgatory burning until they're ready to go where? Amen. To heaven. Right. Now, is this place, as Dennis brought up, real or imagined? Did Luther believe it was real? He did. But by the time, by the end of his life, 1546, he no longer believed in the doctrine itself though he did at the time of the Reformation. Now, all right, a little better idea of purgatory. In fact, for the right price, you could save up for your future sins with indulgences, sort of like a spiritual IRA. That's great news. And the more you paid, the less you'd suffer in purgatory before going to heaven. Now, indulgences were nothing new. Centuries earlier, they paid for some of the crusades against the Muslims. They were used to build the Sistine Chapel because Michelangelo didn't come cheap. And now, they were being used to finance St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. By the way, how many of you have ever been to the Vatican? Have you ever traveled there? A few of you have. I got to do that too. It was quite uh, uh, impressive architecture and the grandeur uh, of it all. Now, the most infamous indulgence hawker was Johann or John Tetzel, who would play on people's emotions. emotions. Get this. He said, would you like your pastor? You probably wouldn't have been so affirming had, had we guilted and manipulated you like this. Here's what he would say. He would tell Catholics, don't, when he was selling indulgences, don't you hear the voices of your dead parents and other relatives crying out from purgatory, have mercy on us, for we suffer great punishment and pain. From this, you could release us with just a few alms. We created you, fed you, left you our temporal goods. Why do you treat us so cruelly and leave us to suffer in the flames when it takes only a little to save us? Can you imagine? Wow. In fact, Tetzel may have created the first commercial jingo because he liked to say, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Isn't that catchy? And it rhymes in German, too. 
Well, when Luther and the Reformers began to examine the Bible more closely, instead of just listening to the teachings of the church, they saw that salvation came by God himself through his Jesus alone without the addition of works. And this is how the Reformation gave birth to the five, starts with an S. Solas, all right. So, re, mi, fa, no, that's a different, okay. I'm gonna list them in Latin, and you're gonna translate them into English, all right? What is sola scriptura? Scripture alone means the highest authority for our beliefs is based on what? The Bible, not on the traditions, authority, or practices of the church. What is sola gratia? Grace alone. Salvation is a free gift that we cannot earn. How about sola fide? All right. Righteousness comes by faith alone, not by a mixture, as they teach, of our works plus faith. Sola Christus. Very good, you guys know Latin. Excellent. Very good. Uh, Christ alone. There's no need for a human mediator or a saint in heaven or for Mary or to do works of penance to contribute to our acceptance with God. And the fifth sola is just a little bit tricky, but I think you'll get it. Soli Dio, Dio Gloria. God gets all the credit for our salvation alone and our lives will result in repentance and living for his glory in all that we do. All right, Luther was fond of saying, the church's true treasure is the gospel. And as you heard in the video, he had rediscovered it. Centuries of churchmen had heaped layer upon layer of extra biblical teaching that obscured this precious treasure. But have you ever seen scaffolding like around the Capitol for so long, right? Like scaffolding that surrounds and hides the beauty of a building, Luther and his fellow reformers tore those unwanted layers down so the object that mattered most before but this time his eyes were open as he read let's select some verses here but now apart from law the righteousness of god has been made known for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god and all are justified freely by god's grace through the redemption that came by christ jesus for a person is justified by faith together with the works of the law. Isn't that great news? Really? <laughs> Wait a minute, let's read it again. A person is justified by faith together with the works of the law. Is that really great news? No, because it's not what it says. That's Luther had been hearing one thing. You know, for centuries people thought spiders had uh, how many legs does a spider have? Eight. Eight, right? Thought they had six. Why did they think they had six? Because Aristotle or someone said they had six legs. And they just always thought, spiders have six legs. They always thought, well, salvation comes as, as a mixture, the deluxe combination of God's grace plus our penance, plus our works. 
But then Luther read this for himself and it stuck. A person is justified by faith apart, separate from the works of the law. And Luther said, quote, it was as though the gates of heaven were open to me at last. Do you know how wonderful it is when you go from fearing, believing that you're hopelessly condemned, that there's just no chance for you to be in heaven, to go from that to the gates of heaven have opened for me personally at last? You mean God loves me? You mean Jesus' blood is enough to save even me? Do you know how wonderful that is for a person to finally experience that blessed assurance? Well, most, can you believe it? Most did not live in a period of time where they could have assurance. In, in fact, the Catholic Church is still today says you can have a moderated, mitigated amount of assurance. It only goes so far. But the Protestant Reformation opened up. Jesus, what did the Apostle John say? These things I write unto you so that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know it. You know, people say, even in the Adventist church, I hear people say, no, you can't say that. Well, you know what? You're not in the spirit of the Reformation or the authority of Scripture because the Bible says you can. There are even other verses that talk about that. All right? We can know that we have salvation. Suddenly, Luther saw and knew the truth of the gospel. He was instantly set free from trying to make himself worthy and acceptable. Luther said, I love this quote. He said, the law says do this, and it is never done. Grace says believe in this, and everything is already done. Isn't that beautiful? Because Luther broke with the authority of the church, he was counted among the Hussites. Was that a good thing? Not at all. That put him in a very dangerous position because the Hussites were followers of five Sabbath shekels. John Huss, whose name meant what? What does Huss mean? Anybody know? Someone said it. Goose! You got it! You got it! Now... He was burned at the stake for openly preaching the gospel, and that's when the phrase, your goose is cooked, came into being. It was right there. And so things were really, the pot was really heating up for Luther. All right, now, the Pope at the time, Leo X, was a member of the rich and powerful, I bet you've heard of them, starts with an M. Medici family, rich and powerful rulers of uh, uh, Italy. Uh, but he was the last to become pope who had never been a priest. He had never been a priest, Leo X. In the Vatican, he lived in such opulence, borrowed and spent so much that he's alleged to have said, since God has given us the papacy, let us enjoy it. Others had long challenged the practices and teachings of the church long before Luther, but with the relatively recent invention of the printing press, Luther's teachings and support for them quickly spread throughout Europe. Eventually, the Pope issued a decree that 41 of Luther's 95 theses were heresy. And then he proclaimed Luther a heretic and gave him 120 days to recant physically in Rome. Luther refused and was excommunicated in 1521, just a few years after 1517. What does excommunication mean? To be out of, ex means out, exit. To be out of communion with the church which was a much graver situation than being uh, not dismembered. Disfellowship. Wow. Well, I hope we don't dismember today. 
Wow, uh, what they did back then, <laughs> you, you, you got disfellowshipped and dismembered back then. All right, maybe that's not so off. All right, so he was uh, disfellowshipped, out of communion with the church. In response, Luther published a paper titled, All the Articles Wrongly Condemned by the Papal Decree, and that's when he called the Pope the Antichrist. And if you know Martin Luther, if you've done any history writing, uh, he was not necessarily a refined man. Uh, he was refined in his learning. I mean, this guy was an absolute brilliant, intelligent scholar. But people of the day were much more crude than they are. And I will not give you examples, but you can go on the internet. And he commissioned woodcuts, which would be like graphic artists today, uh, uh, of all kinds of nasty, terrible things about the popes and the church and, and, and all of that. And his language was crass. However, however, God used him where he was to bring out these truths. Luther was summoned by King Charles and the church to what he thought would be a debate. But when he got to the great assembly, you know, I've always thought as a little kid, I, I wrote, you know, diet of worms. How disgusting. Why? Is that was his punishment? He had to appear before the diet of worms and eat that terrible stuff. No, no, it means assembly in the town of worms uh, with a V, all right? Now, he's there, thought it was going to be a debate, but when the meetings began, he discovered he was really there to what? To go on trial. And it was really, really uh, a kangaroo court. His books were laid out on a table and he was asked just two questions. Are these your writings and will you retract them? Luther was caught a bit off guard. He was very nervous and he knew he was in trouble either way. So to buy time, he said, look, the issues are so great. May I have a night to pray, which he was granted. The next day, after Luther spoke before the assembly, an official said, you have still not answered the question. It sounds like you're putting us on trial. Look, you're required to give a clear and precise answer. Will you or will you not retract? Without hesitation, then Luther, Luther replied, since you require a clear and precise answer, I will give you one. I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils because it is clear that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other unless I am convicted by the clear testimony of Scripture or by the clearest reasoning, I cannot and will not retract for it is unsafe for a Christian to what? Remember? To speak against his conscience. And though it is not in any of the official transcripts, he is largely attributed as saying, here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Folks, he stood resolute even though he knew his life was at stake. Could we do that? Look how strongly, you know, I, I might get up there and go, well, now, let's, <laughs> you know, let's kind of look at this. Uh, come on now. Uh, no, no. He was clear. He was absolutely clear. And look, despite the agreement he could return safely home, what did the church really do? They had a secret plot to arrest him. Uh, uh, Prince Frederick got word of it and he seized him on his journey home, hid him in his Wartburg castle until it was eventually, some years later, safe to return to public. While hiding, Luther translated the Bible into the common German vernacular, even affected German to this day. Several people of great influence joined the movement, like Zwingli and Calvin in Switzerland and John Knox in Scotland, countless others. Persecution and war followed in the wake of the Reformation, but the gospel fires were lit. Great. The question we're left with today is, what does the Reformation mean for us now? I'd like to uh, step away from my notes for a moment and ask an honest question that I asked myself. The Reformation was some, you know, 500 years ago. 
if Luther had lived today instead of then, would there still have been a Reformation? Yeah, give me your reasons. Anyone, you could, anyone. I'm sorry? God is leading. You believe God would have led him to bring up. In other words, is there still a need for the Reformation? And why do I ask that? Uh, again, I want to be tactful and careful. Uh, but did you know uh, Pope Francis has been very uh, gracious? And uh, you know, for the last 30 years plus, uh, Catholics and Lutherans have been coming together in an ecumenical movement and saying, hey, let's all get along. I've told you before how I went to uh, the Italian Alps and uh, I visited Tori Polici and went up into the uh, College of the Barbers and, 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 and saw where they hid. And the uh, Waldenses today signed an agreement that they, uh, they have gone back in accordance with the Catholic Church. They're not Catholic, but they say we, the past is past and we no longer have these differences. So the Lutherans have signed accords. Pope Francis is celebrating, in a sense, the Reformation. He says Luther was an intelligent guy, and they're considering taking him off the heresy list, the heretic list, all right? So I ask you, would Luther see that, still see a need for pointing these things out that he pointed out 500 years ago? We need to be so careful in our study and in our weeding through things because, folks, I have to tell you, I come from a Catholic background, not as much as some of you or my wife does, but uh, when I listen to their uh, proponents, when I listen to their apologists and I read their writings, they write things in such a beautiful spin to them You'd want to sign up for an indulgence yourself. You'd want to, you'd, you, you'd say, well, I guess it's not. I, I guess going to a priest or praying to Mary or any of those things, okay, I see the practicality of it. I see how Christ is at the center of it all. And you'd say, how do I debate that? You've got to be so careful and go by the word of God alone. I'm going to give you one example, John 20. John 20 says, Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit. And he said, whoever sins you remit will be remitted. And it was whoever sins you retain, they'll be retained. What are you going to say to them? Oh, yeah. They've got answers for everything. My appeal at this moment is, without going into detail, I'm not attacking any of our our Catholic brothers and sisters, whom I think serve the Lord more deeply than I do, some of them. I'd go, wow, I want to have your faith. Catholics have become more evangelical, more spiritual, many of them, more mission-minded, more biblically-minded, many of them. So I'm not here to bash a Catholic individual. I'm only here to say very, very carefully and humbly that despite all the moves to come together, Folks, in the end, when power returns, the Bible predicts another church-state union that will persecute once power returns. So what looks lamb-like and innocent now? What happened during World War II? This nation was founded on the principles of freedom and democracy. But what did we learn? Given a sufficient crisis, all our freedoms can be taken away just like that. There were Japanese, people of Japanese heritage who had American citizenship and their businesses and freedoms were gone just like that. They were American citizens. I spoke with many of them. I pastored them in Hawaii and I heard their terrible stories. They were God-fearing good, faithful, patriotic Americans, and just like that, they were gone. And by the way, they got $25,000 or something for losing years of their life and all of their businesses and their reputation. It was just, just a black spot in America's 
uh, heritage, and not one Japanese American citizen ever committed treason against uh, the United States. Not a single one. So what am I saying? Given a sufficient crisis, history will repeat itself. And history will repeat itself as regards to the beast power that we're going to be learning more about soon. So what does the Reformation mean for us today? Oh, folks. Luther said, here I stand. Here I stand. Can you imagine that night he went to pray before appearing before the assembly? Can you imagine the testing that came to his convictions, the torment of his honest-hearted soul as he thought to himself, can I really be right against so many? I'm just one. Can I really be right alone against so many? Can you imagine how hard that must have been? Can I just be, this is crazy. Who am I compared to century of theologians and scholars and popes and most of the known Christian world who agrees with them? Who am I to be right against so many? Church family, I gently say to you that one day, we may be asking the same question of ourselves. We may be in Luther's position. However you interpret end time scenarios to play out, one thing is for sure, there is coming a test of our deepest loyalty and allegiance and affection for God. And we will no doubt ask the same question Luther asked of himself, how can I be right against so, so many? But in my mind, the issue isn't ultimately my church against the bad church. Because Ellen White said the last message to be given to the world before Christ returns is not merely to warn people about the mark of the beast. She said it's really about the message of what? Of justification by faith. Who's that a message about? about Jesus. Yes, church and state will once more unite, attempting to compel, but the ultimate test will not be whether we're for a good church and against a bad church. People won't, don't die because I die because I'm, I've got a good church, or I die because you have a bad church. No, it won't be that. It will be whether or not we trust wholly in Jesus for everything, including and starting with our salvation in him alone. Because at that point, we may very well need to stand alone as Luther and the reformers did against so many. So then, in these last days, are we still standing? Are we still standing? Can we still stand with the reformers in relying on the blood of Jesus alone to save us? Can we still stand when we're taunted for following the Bible alone uh, instead of the religious traditions and demands of the world? Can we still stand in never going back on our faith no matter how hard we're pressed to give in? Can we still stand because we allow the Holy Spirit to reform our hearts into the precious image of our wonderful Lord. Just before we close, I just want to say this, folks. We will talk in times to come about the mark of the beast and the seal of God within our Sabbath series that we're doing. But please, I have found that people can become so obsessed with the power of the beast out there that they forget about the beast within. Don't consume yourself with trying to overcome the beast out there. Make sure Jesus has conquered the beast within. And then you'll be right with him, and then you'll be ready to stand no matter what comes your way. Did you know Luther was a prolific hymn writer and he wrote, uh, 
its most famous song was called the Battle Hymn of the Reformation. Let's stand and sing it together, A Mighty Fortress, number 506. Let us pray, loving Father. It just hit me in such a deeper way, almost a shock, and the challenge that it represents that if Luther were here, there'd still be a need for a reformation. Oh Lord, that means it hasn't stopped, it mustn't stop. And that means that you still need your children to stand for you today. Are we still standing? Will we still stand? Let us, in the authority of Scripture, in our salvation in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, please, dear Lord, help us give you all the credit and glory from start to finish. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.